to the Polgar Chess University. In this week's lesson, I'd like to tell you about critical positions, critical moments of a game. That's very, very important, and one of the difficulties is to recognize during a game when did that critical moment arrive. In order to improve at sensing that moment, it's necessary to examine, to study, to practice, to try to solve those type of situations. And that's what I'd like to help you with in today's lesson. In this lesson, I use examples from the historic tournament that was played in Nottingham in 1936. Here is our first example, a game that was played between Grandmasters Widmar and Bogoyubov. At the first sight, it seems that White's position is completely winning, being a pawn up, and in addition, Black has double pawns on the e-file, and on top of everything, all of those pawns are on light color square for a white bishop to be readily available for attack. Nevertheless, this is a very critical moment in this game, and if white would get another move or two to make himself comfortable and bring the king closer to the action, indeed black's position would be quite hopeless. But here Black has a very interesting opportunity that involves sacrificing an exchange. And in this position Black played rook f3, which of course can and should be captured. And now rook f2. It's true that now the Black King can go after the pawn on h4, but nevertheless even after Black captures that pawn, white is still a full exchange ahead. The difficulty lies in the fact that black has a far advanced passed pawn on f3 that for a time being ties down the white rook. So what may be white's winning plan here? That definitely you should be looking for if you play with the black pieces before you would sacrifice an exchange. The winning plan for white should be trying to change places between the king and the rook and park the king on f2 while the rook would go all around perhaps to the f-file and at the right moment give up the rook for the bishop and the f3 pawn and to transpose to an easily winning pawn endgame. Of course, this is a plan, but not necessarily achievable. In the meantime, White continued with King d2, trying to accomplish this very goal. And this was an important moment in the game, where Black played careless. Let's see what happened. Black played Bishop to e4, allowing White to play advancing the pawn to a4, which is an important move, as we'll find out a bit later. And this is how the game continued. And now White's plan is to swing the rook around to the g-file to check and chase the black king away from the g-file. And now the white king is able to move towards g1. Immediately playing rook d8 wouldn't have worked because black would have played king g2, threatening to promote the f-pawn. And now continued king f1, bishop c6, and rook d6. Now we already can see that the rook is about to go to g6 to check and then the white king could occupy the key blockading f2 square. Came bishop e4 and rook f6. Bishop d3 check, king e1. Now if black would kind of make waiting moves, the rook would go to f7 and g7 and chase the black king away. 
black played bishop c2 going after the b3 pawn but white temporarily gives up on this pawn in order to achieve its goal to get the rook to the g-file came king h4 and king f2 mission accomplished and now black will not be able to hang on for too long to all his pawns a very important move rook d6 not letting the bishop to d5 black continued with bishop c4 and rook d4 now after bishop d3 rook b4 black would be unable to hang on to both the b7 and e4 pawns black played bishop b5 and then after rook e4 it's not hard to imagine that the game is lost for black let's move back to the beginning of this position and let's move again rook f3 bishop takes pawn takes rook f2 king h5 king c2 king h4 king d2 it was very crucial that the white king is running quickly so by the time the black king gets to g3 attacking the white rook white will be ready to come and protect the rook on f2 and this was the moment when black missed his opportunity to actually save the game black could have and should have played b5 because now for example after a4 black would trade and get his bishop onto this very important diagonal that includes the promotion square of black's f3 pawn white's problem now is that the rook doesn't get to go around and leave the second rank because as soon as the rook would move up to say c7 the f pawn would be ready to advance and then promote with the help of the bishop on a6 so this is kind of a difficult endgame but uh, the way you learn it you try to figure it out on your own and even if you don't succeed you listen to the solution and you learn and you gain ideas it's very important to develop your pattern recognition and you gain different ideas so you can use it in similar positions okay let's move on to our next position that was played between Alexander and Floor in the same tournament in 1936 and this was a critical position where it was Black's turn Black has a very dangerous fast pawn on a3 that's about to get promoted the question is what should be Black's next move? with a closer look it's not hard to recognize that White has a serious threat in moving the knight to f7 followed by checkmate in the corner the big question is what should Black do about it? In the actual game, black played a2, which was a big mistake because it indeed allowed knight f7 when black was forced to give up his bishop and then his rook for the knight and white got the opportunity to give up his own rook for black's newly born queen and this is also a very instructive rook endgame now where white succeeds to put his rook to a very very stable place where it cannot be attacked and the white king now is completely free to support the advancement of the c pawn at the same time the rook on g4 not only that protects both the c4 and g2 pawns but also pressures black's pawns on the g5 
The game concluded the following way. Trying to cut off the white king from the queen side. But white with the offer of rook exchange solves that problem. And the king walks to the queen side. And the rook goes back occupying its perfect location on g4. And in this position, black resigned. But let's go back to the starting position. And I suggest you take some time and try to figure out what should black do to prevent this serious trouble with knight f7. Hope you had a chance to figure out the correct move here, which is playing rook to f5. Looks like this is just even inviting the knight to come to f7, but the big difference is that now the rook gets to come to h5 and solve all those problems in the corner. In the meantime, maintaining the power of the a3 pawn that's about to get promoted. So after rook f5, the key question is, what would happen after e7? Some very interesting situations arise after a2 when both sides get to promote their pawns. And now white is threatening to play queen e6, which would be almost checkmate. And now black would have a very interesting defensive move by queen a6 in the hopes that if now rook takes rook, then black has perpetual checks on d6 and d1, as it would be even worse for white if he would try to play on for a win by playing g3 and allowing rook f2, and black would checkmate in the next couple of moves. Going back to this position after queen a6, it's amazing that white can still win here. Try to think and figure out what is the brilliant move that gives white the win. Amazingly, it's a quiet and peaceful move, moving the queen all the way back to e1. See, these moves are difficult to see at least from a distance. It's not that easy to see even when you have it in front of you. Obviously, the idea is that if rook takes rook, then we would sacrifice the second rook and get the queen to the h-file with a tempo and then checkmate on h7. But what would happen if after this brilliant queen e1 move, black wouldn't capture the rook but would capture the knight? In that case, the solution is rook takes rook and after queen takes rook, Queen e6, checkmate. Very brilliant. So again, let's go back to the starting position. We already know the correct move is rook f5, but then e7 was giving trouble. Black needs to be very accurate here again, and the correct move is to sacrifice the bishop for the pawn, and only after that advance the pawn. Again, white is retreating the rook. The big difference now is that black maintained still the a pawn, unlike in the game continuation when we reached a similar rook end game, but without black's a2 pawn. Now it's only black who can win, and I think black has excellent winning chances, for example, in the following variation. The two black rooks will try to get together on the second rank. And this is just a sample variation to show ideas what black should do. And obviously it's only white that's in any danger of losing, not black. And now the white rook has been trying, hanging on to the pawn on g2, but the problem is that won't be able to keep doing that much longer because now the black rook is threatening 
to trap white rook or force a trade and therefore the white rook will need to move either to the a file or to d6 so it rook b1 could be answered with rook to d1 but then black finally gets the g2 pawn and will get one more pawn giving excellent winning chances So these are excellent type of exercises where it's not just like a white to move or black to move and win or draw, but it's kind of more complex and it either requires very deep calculation or, or good intuition. But uh, you really need to try to see as far as you can. And the main thing is that you gain ideas, you learn more patterns. As uh, some researchers uh, said, an average chess grandmaster is familiar with about 20,000 different chess patterns. Now that sounds like a humongous number, but in reality, I'm sure if you're listening to this lesson, you are already familiar with probably a couple of thousand. So you already know quite a lot and you have a long way to go. But if you keep learning and, and uh, getting familiarized with more patterns, the better chance you'll have to find it when it comes along in your game. Let's see now a couple of more concrete examples. This next position is also from the same tournament between Winter and the Cuban chess genius, former world champion, Jose Raul Capablanca. In this position, black is a knight ahead at the moment, but it's white's turn. Black also has a serious threat of checkmating with queen e2 followed by queen g2. So white has to be very careful and uh, the question is what to do. White can give checks in various ways or maybe something else trying to defend directly against the checkmate threat. Again, I suggest you take your time and try to figure out what you would do to save the game or to win the game. It's definitely noticeable that the Black King is in a delicate position out of its safety zone. Let me first show you what happened in the game. White played Queen H7, which was a losing mistake. Even though the black king is marching around kind of in the middle of the board, nevertheless, white is hopeless. White had one more check to give, and probably what white forgot about when he gave the check on h7, that after the rook g1 check, black does not need to move out of the check, but actually can capture the rook followed by checkmate with rook e1. Whoops, that's unpleasant. Okay, let's go back and think again. That's what you should not fall for. And the correct answer is simply moving the queen to c4 on the defensive, not allowing the queen e4 check, or if that would come, white would just exchange queens. Black cannot avoid the exchange of the queens because, for example, after queen d2, white would be checkmating right away. On the other hand, after the exchange of queens, white has major material advantage. Black can try to still win the pawn on f5 and get counterplay, but by correct play, black will lose further material. Rook g8, attacking the knight. Now if knight captures f5, then white is winning after check using the pin around, along the g-file. King can try to come to h3, threatening with back rank checkmate, but then force checkmate comes after rook takes h4. Again, let's go back and see what happens if black does not capture the pawn in this position right away, but plays rather king to h3. 
And then white would continue with rook check in the corner, forcing the kick back to g4. And now a preventive move, a preparation move, king g1. So when the black knight would take the pawn, then h3, king takes pawn, and we can safely capture the knight as after rook e1, the rook can retreat to f1 and white would be easily winning. As you can see, there are so many examples, even within one tournament, where there are missed opportunities. Let's see the next example, which is a very famous example by former world champions Lasker and Oewe. Black has a very comfortable and uh, advantageous position, white having an isolated pawn on d4. In the meantime, black here made a blunder. By playing an intermediate move, counterattacking white's knight was a major mistake. Try to pause for a moment and figure out what the correct solution is. Obviously, if king would take the knight, the bishop would take the knight, and black would maintain his positional advantage. The same would apply if white would move his knight and then black would move his knight or protect his knight, black would still maintain a small advantage. What Uwe missed was that white can play now b4, sacrificing a pawn, and after bishop takes pawn, the white knight can move away by attacking the bishop while the black knight is still under attack, and therefore black will lose a piece. And let's see the next position from the same tournament between Rashevsky and Tartakova. In this position, white played knight f4, centralizing his knight. And black made a major mistake. Black should have played probably knight to a6, for example, or rook e8, or c6, or some move like that. Black didn't follow one of the basic opening principles, that is, don't move the same piece twice until all your other minor pieces are developed. And he moved his knight to e4 prematurely. And this was a critical moment where white took advantage of the opportunity and won a pawn. Can you see the correct move? Yes, indeed. Its knight simply captures on d5 winning a pawn. After this very instructive critical positions, let's see the jewel of the week. This position was composed by Newman in 1914. If you look at this position, it seems that white should pretty much resign as black has a queen, white doesn't seem to have anything going for him. But as beautiful as chess is, this is one of those examples when miracle happens and white can escape. Try to think and figure out a solution for yourself before you listen further and look at the solution. The answer is knight f6. Wow, what is that? Giving up the knight? Yes, it is. Well, let's stop for a moment and see what would happen if the king does not capture the knight. If the queen moves to c8 right now, white could give checkmate, in fact, in two moves, right after these moves. Or, if after knight f6, the queen would capture the pawn, then the checkmate would come from g5. Okay, so black has to capture the knight after it moves to f6. And now what? Amazing! White can afford a quiet move playing e4. Again threatening both of those checkmates that we saw already in earlier variations. But now black has time to play e5 and clear the e6 square for the king. So how are we gonna save this game? Check. King e6. Check. King d6, bishop f8, almost checkmate, but it's not quite checkmate. The queen can block. 
And if bishop takes queen, king takes bishop, black still has a completely winning position with the c pawn being unstoppable. So is white lost anyway? No. Quite amazingly in this position, white can play f6. Amazing. Attacking the queen a second time, provoking the queen to capture the bishop and to create an amazing stalemate. A beauty. I am really impressed by this position. Well, I hope you enjoyed it and learned from the critical positions. Hopefully, when you get one of those similar positions, you'll know what to do. Thank you so much for listening and so long until next week. Mm -hmm.